New at 5.30, eight people have died from a mysterious lung disease connected to vaping, and health officials are investigating uh, various cases, more than 500 nation. Sean Bills was admitted to the hospital on Saturday. Now he is in a drug induced coma. Now on Monday, the number of hospitalizations possibly linked to vaping have doubled here in the state of Utah. On life support and in a coma, 31 year old Sean Bills suffers from pneumonia in both lungs. It hit out of nowhere, that's for sure. His wife Tiffany says doctors believe vaping is to blame. They've had th four other cases. My husband is the fifth at the hospital right now in critical condition because of vaping. The couple vaped daily for two years. These are the ones that me and my husband were using before. He ended up in the hospital. Ten days ago, the otherwise healthy father of three knew something was wrong. It's starting with shortness of breath and, and pain and not being able to breathe. And that's why he's in a coma right now is because he can't breathe on his own. Tiffany says it's pneumonia, likely caused by inhaling fat particles. These are the juices possibly that are causing the issue. The Utah Department of Health says there are now 10 cases of severe lung disease possibly linked to vaping. Nationwide, more than 100 people develop similar problems. The cluster so troubling, the CDC is investigating. U.S. Surgeon General has called e-cigarette use among youth an epidemic. And now Tristan, a 17-year-old from Texas, is warning other teens by sharing what happened to him. <coughs> It's an unnerving scene. The body of a teen spasming in a coughing fit on a ventilator just to breathe. It just progressively got, for, got worse extremely fast. 17-year-old <coughs> Tristan Zofield was taken to Cook Children's Hospital in Fort Worth, Texas with blockage in his lungs. I woke up just throwing up everywhere and my heart was just pounding out of my chest going 100 miles an hour. And doctors believe it was all because of vaping. He's a very sick, otherwise healthy looking child and we don't see previously healthy 17-year-olds that sick that quickly. In late July, Tristan's family sat by his side day after day, not knowing what was wrong as he lay in a medically induced coma. We were baffled at first. We had no idea what was going on. His parents then learned Tristan had been vaping without their knowledge since the eighth grade, sometimes as many as two to three vape pods a week. You don't want your child to have to go through what we went through to get to the point that he came to. And this isn't the first teen hospitalized after vaping use. The CDC has identified 153 cases of severe lung illness associated with e-cigarette use across 16 states. The CDC continues to investigate and has not identified a particular device or liquid as being associated with those cases. For Tristan, he's now hoping to warn other teens. It's a big deal. It's not something to look over. <laughs> Tristan survived after being in a medically induced coma for 10 days. He says she became mysteriously ill in late July. My temperature was so high, my brain just completely shut off. But. I thought I was in the Payson Hospital for one night and I was actually there for four days. From there, she says she ended up at Timpanogos Regional Hospital in the ICU for three days. Doctors would figure out... I had fat particles growing inside my lungs that were related to the glycerin and vape juice. So and then my lungs were full of fluid and they said that my chest x-rays was one of the worst that they've ever seen. We're starting to see more patients with pretty severe uh, pneumonias, pulmonary reactions as a result of what we believe to be vaping. One Monday I just woke up and I was just feeling really sick and I just thought like I was coming down with a cold or something. And started getting on chest pain. It was hard to breathe. Um, you know, it was coughing. We just kind of figured it was a bug. Some people have been quite ill. Other people, have, other people have been less ill. And I think our big concern is that we just don't have a good sense of what exactly in these vaping products are causing these illnesses. And then you had some lung findings on the chest radiograph or CAT scan and you didn't see any other evidence of any other diseases causing infection or heart problems, that would be a probable case. And there's other testing that you can do that would progress it to be more of a confirmed case. The pathologist can stain it for the oils. So you can see that the cells that eat up the bad elements that get into our lungs are stained with oil. The injury on the CAT scan, that together with the stained macrophages, together with the history of vaping that included oils, Put it together, we now have a new entity of uh, pneumonia that 
is related to oil damaging the lungs. Uh, symptoms people have come in with are uh, probably most commonly shortness of breath, cough, uh, often fever, often flu-like symptoms, so kind of just an ill feeling, sometimes chills. So how do you, those are pretty nonspecific mm -hmm. symptoms, how do you then determine whether it's the vaping related illness? So the, the key has been, has been that the only identifiable cause in all of these cases was uh, history of vaping, generally daily vaping. We're hoping that it will offer clues to understanding the cause of illness, both kind of understanding the mechanism of, of illness as well as um, better identifying what the specific cause is or what particular component in the vaping product might be causing the illness. So do we have any ideas at this point um, about what the cause could be? Um, I think we don't know the answer to that. So, so far there has not been any single vaping product, ingredient, device um, that has been tied to all cases. Uh, so we don't, we can't say that there is one specific cause. Some have referred to this illness as lipoid pneumonia. Um, mm -hmm. Is that accurate? Um, mm -hmm. And what is lipoid pneumonia? So lipoid pneumonia is something that is often characterized by the finding of lipid-laden macrophages, or these immune cells containing fat or lipid-like material. Um, you know, typically we have seen this in the setting of aspiration into the lungs of some oil or fat-like material. Um, we are seeing that same finding on bronchoscopy here, but I don't know that we can call this lipoid pneumonia. The presentation is different, it's more acute, and it's um, it's a, it's a different illness. So first of all, we are hoping to better understand the specific cause of this illness. Um, and I know a lot of investigation is ongoing as to what the sp specific component of vaping products uh, are leading to this illness. Um, we are hoping to better understand the mechanism for illness. So for instance, what's going on with the immune system? Are there any individual characteristics of patients that make them more susceptible to developing this lung injury with vaping. Um, and then we are also hoping to un understand how to treat this uh, illness because we still do not know what the optimal treatment is. And that brings up a good point. What is the treatment right now? Uh, we don't know. Um, just let them rest. You know, stopping vaping seems to be the key treatment. Some people have also been treated with steroids, but we can't say that that has led to their recovery. You know, at this point, we're just doing empiric treatments that we hope will help. These four lab samples show damaged lung cells, all from people who vaped and developed chemical-type burn injuries. This Mayo Clinic study was the first to examine biopsies from seven patients, all suspected of having vape-related lung injuries. Researchers found the damage was not caused by an accumulation of mineral oil in their lungs, as previously suspected. Hi, my name is Sanjay Mukhopadhyay. I'm Director of Pulmonary Pathology at the Cleveland Clinic. And today I'm going to talk to you about a very important issue of national public health importance in the United States, and that is the epidemic of lung disease that's associated with vaping. Um, so the title of this talk is Vaping Under the Microscope, What Do Lung Biopsies Tell Us? And th the title is made in this way because we're going to focus on what we see under the microscope in lung biopsies in pa patients who are sick from vaping. Most of these patients presented either with cough or dyspnea, which is shortness of breath, or with fever. So the first slide I'm going to show you is the CT scans from these patients, and you can see that they are highly abnormal. Um, now, CT scans, um, when they look at normal lungs, should look black. So the lungs um, are filled with air, and the characteristic look of a normal lung is that it looks black on a high-resolution CT scan. Instead, you can see that these lungs, each one of them is from a different patient. So, for example, the one in part A is different from the one in part D. These are four very different patients. 
but you can see the look is kind of similar. There is bilateral lung abnormality, meaning on both sides, there's a kind of haziness in the lung that's called ground glass opacities. And then there's a more dense kind of abnormality in some areas that is called consolidation. So this is generally what's been reported in the recent literature as to what the CT scans look like when you, when you take them from patients who have vaping associated uh, pulmonary illness is that they have bilateral ground glass opacities and that was the case in all of our patients. Now when we look at the biopsy findings, one of the findings that we uh, noticed was this finding called organizing pneumonia. And the characteristic finding that you see in that is this structure called a fibroblast plug, uh, which is seen here and down here. So the fibroblast plug is, is a sort of polyp-like growth within the alveoli that is filled with fibroblasts. And what's trying to happen here is that the lung is trying to heal itself from a, a, a form of acute lung injury. So organizing pneumonia was seen in some of our cases. Then some other cases that we saw showed diffuse alveolar damage, the ki kind of uh, pathology that you see in patients who end up on a ventilator or, or who have to go to the ICU. So it's a very, very severe form of lung injury. And the characteristic finding that you see in this is uh, what we call hyaline membranes, which are these pink ribbon-like structures that you see in the middle of the picture. Uh, I will mention that the one patient um, in this series who died also had diffuse alveolar damage in his lungs. Now, the other finding that we found in some of these cases was of, uh, the, the presence of fibrin or fibrinous exudates within the alveoli. So within the lumen of the alveolus were these fibrinous exudates, which are these pink little blobs that you see uh, within the air spaces here. And then, which is the most controversial part of this uh, pathology, and I, I think is going to engender a lot of debate in, in coming months, if not years, is the presence of a particular kind of cell called a macrophage. And the macrophage is a cell that within the lung just eats up debris. And, and that's the function of the macrophage, to wander within the lung and eat any kind of debris and then clear it out from the lung parenchyma. So that's what they normally do. Um, and in normal lungs, you don't have too many macrophages. They're just an occasional one wandering around the lung. But in the vaping-associated pulmonary illness, some cases have a lot of macrophages within the alveoli. So I'll point them out. These cells within the air spaces, like the one that the arrow is showing now, is a macrophage. This one is a macrophage, and this one is a macrophage. Now, the interesting part about it is that there is a theory that vaping-associated lung illness is caused by some sort of a lipid or an oily substance. People have uh, brought up vitamin E that's present in the vape fluid in some cases. And that oily or lipid substance, the theory goes, is damaging the lung, and therefore you should see lipid in the lung in some form. So what people have done is they have stained the washout that you do during the bronchoscopic procedure, that's called bronchoalveolar lavage fluid. So they have stained that lavage fluid for a marker of lipid, and that's called oil red O. And the oil red O is positive in some cases. So people say, say well, our theory is correct because we think there's lipid, and when we, we stain for lipid in the fluid in these cases, it's positive. So this is a lipid pneumonia. Unfortunately, that theory is not entirely true. Now, when you get a lipid substance that's aspirated into the lung from an outside source, that's called exogenous lipoid pneumonia. And the typical features of exogenous lipoid pneumonia are not seen in these biopsies. So we haven't seen any features of exogenous lipoid pneumonia in our biopsy series. And the other series that's come out from the Mayo Clinic also has not seen features of exogenous lipoid pneumonia. Do these macrophages have lipid in them? I think the answer is yes. They do have lipid, but the lipid might be coming from an endogenous source, that is from dead and dying cells in the lung itself, not from an exogenous source. So that's one major finding that's going to be a center of debate in, in the coming days. Now here's another uh, way to look at macrophages. And this is an immunohistochemical stain for CD68. And CD68 is a marker that's present on macrophages. So everything that you see here that's brown is a macrophage, and clearly there's a lot of macrophages there. So clearly there are macrophages in these lungs. Clearly they are increased in some cases. Some of them have lipid, some of them look foamy, but they do not have features of exogenous lipoid pneumonia. Now you might wonder, what are those features? So let me show you an example, and this is taken from the paper that's just about to come out. On the left-hand side, I'm showing you a picture from a patient who was aspirating mineral oil into their lungs. And typically mineral oil is taken by people for, who are constipated, so they're trying to uh, help with that symptom. But in some cases, instead of going into the GI tract, that mineral oil goes into the lungs, and that's clearly an exogenous 
lipoid pneumonia. And if you look at the picture, the, the vacuoles in the macrophages in exogenous lipoid pneumonia have a very characteristic appearance. Some of them are big, some of them are small, they are varying sizes. These are large vacuoles and they are a coarse, have a kind of coarse look. In contrast, the picture on the right hand side is from a patient who had vaping associated pulmonary illness. These macrophages also have a foamy look, but they do not have the coarse, large vacuoles and the uh, variation in size that's seen in exogenous lipoid pneumonia. So this is very important to point out that our findings in these patients with the vaping associated lung disease do not match up with the findings that you typically see in exogenous lipoid pneumonia. And this is a very important finding that's come out only in recent days. So I'll sum up here the lung biopsy findings from patients with vaping associated pulmonary illness. What are the biopsy findings? First, we are seeing acute lung injury patterns. Second, we are seeing no evidence of exogenous lipoid pneumonia. And third, the findings that we are seeing are not specific for vaping. In other words, a pathologist that looks at this biopsy without knowing that the patient vaped can't tell just from the biopsy findings that this is related to vape. My message is just consider the possibility of vaping associated pulmonary illness, especially in young people with cough, dyspnea or fever. Now one thing I'll point out here is some of these patients are young people who are not previously ill and are coming in with a febrile illness with fever. So especially in the flu season, this, this can be very confusing. You might think that the patient has a flu but doesn't respond to, to treatment. 53 patients in Illinois and Wisconsin. The imaging findings that were described in this case series include the presence of bilateral opacities on chest radiography, which develop eventually in all affected patients, and the presence of ground glass opacities on CT, often with subpleural sparing. Of note, patients who present with abdominal symptoms may have the abnormalities seen in the lung bases on the uppermost portion of an abdominal CT scan performed for these patients. The imaging findings have been described in a series of 34 patients in a correspondence in the New England Journal of Medicine published in September of 2019. The CT findings of affected patients have been divided into four main patterns on CT. These include diffuse alveolar damage, lipoid pneumonia, acute eosinophilic pneumonia, and organizing pneumonia. Here is a case example provided courtesy of Dr. Travis Henry from the Department of Radiology at the University of California, San Francisco Medical Center. In this teenage patient suffering from vaping associated lung injury, the chest radiograph demonstrates the presence of symmetric bilateral ground glass and lower zone airspace opacities with small right and probable small left pleural effusions identified. CT examination in the same patient shows the presence of bilateral ground glass opacity and more dependent airspace consolidation. A small right pleural effusion is present. We can see here in a patient under investigation an area of peripheral ground glass opacification with a more focal area of consolidation superimposed on the ground glass opacification. This is a case of confirmed COVID-19 where the patient has this peripheral area of consolidation, although there do remain some areas of ground glass opacification within the more consolidative airspace opacities. In more progressed or severe cases of COVID-19, you may see diffuse ground glass opacification with areas of consolidation. So in this case, the, con the process is still predominantly peripheral. It's ground glass predominant diffuse lung disease with areas of developing consolidation.
This is another case of severe COVID pneumonia. And in this case, we start to see more of that architectural distortion. So it almost looks like the lung is tethered or being pulled. And we start to see these more linear opacities in addition to the areas of consolidation and ground glass opacification. Another finding that's being reported is bronchiolar dilation in the region of pulmonary abnormality. So we have these areas of ground glass opacity that are peripheral and are starting to have superimposed consolidation. And notice the bronchi within these regions of airspace opacification are dilated and more prominent than the, in the part of the lung that does not have ground glass or consolidation. Again, bronchiolar dilation in the regions of pulmonary abnormality. This is again a case of severe confirmed COVID-19 pneumonia. This is a nice example of the linear opacities that are sometimes reported. This patient had ground glass predominant disease, but if you look in the right middle lobe here, you can start to see some linear opacities. These linear opacities spread throughout the lung are associated with some ground glass opacity and some consolidation. And we can also see bronchiolar dilation. So you see these dilated bronchioles in the area, or bronchi, in the area of abnormality. So you get bronch dilation or bronchiolar dilation in the areas of abnormality. Again, a case of confirmed COVID-19 that's relatively severe, but notice predominantly we have peripheral patchy ground glass opacification with some areas of developing consolidation. a story from Amarillo, Texas about a man who contracted a lung illness from vaping. Though the headlines claim that it's from regular nicotine vaping, looking a little bit deeper into the story will show that it has nothing to do with regular vaping at all. ABC News 7 in Texas did a news segment regarding a man by the name of Ben Camarillo. Ben was hospitalized with severe lung damage and according to ABC News, it was from vaping. They interviewed Ben along with Chris, a man who owns a vape shop in Texas called 806 Vapes. However, once the segment aired on live TV, both Ben and Chris were outraged as they completely twisted their words. But they also showed a photo of Ben holding a sign that's extremely similar to the sign Seema Herman was holding. Chris from 806 Vapes then made a nine minute video showcasing what was actually said versus what was aired, and the difference is insane. So the news, essentially the segment, took your interview and took your words but twisted them in a way to make it into something completely wrong. Exactly. When I told her I vape THC products for PTSD, as soon as that part aired, they showed e-juice. They showed e-juice and vape mods immediately. 
And I never said a word about that. And, uh, and Ben's catching a lot of heat for that. And Ben's catching a lot of heat from you guys for a lot of things that he didn't do. Uh, we want you guys to know that, that Ben didn't go into the hospital saying, I vape flavored nicotine products. Uh, ben didn't go into the hospital saying vaping made me sick. Uh, ben, ben hasn't done any of these things. So there's no reason that anybody in the vape indi vapor industry should be upset with Ben. Uh, ben is one of the very, very few people that have gotten sick and told the truth. And, and I have a feeling that they tried to pressure Ben's mind into thinking, you're sick from vaping, Ben. <laughs> and that, that's kind of what's happened here is, and it could be happening in more places than just here in Amarillo, and I'm sure it is. I, I'm sure that a lot of these people are getting feedback from medical professionals that they're supposed to trust uh, that vaping is making them sick. Uh, when we know damn good and well, vaping didn't make Ben sick. Uh, the way they went, and it was totally wrong, they shouldn't have done it. Banning flavored vapor products in the United States is not going to solve this problem. This is not a flavored vapor product problem. This video was intended to show you that the media does not have your best interest at heart. The United States government does not have your best interest at heart, and the United States government is not working in the favor of public health. As we first explained, the CDC said they were seriously considering an interview with us. Then a couple months later, they ran from the camera when met with a challenge of answering tough yet fair and balanced questions, which for the record, I even sent the CDC prior to the interview per their request. When the CDC dodged us, I contacted the FDA, eventually met with the same tactic. After a back and forth for months, they were reluctant to answer questions, refusing to be interviewed on camera. From the public health officials. You know, and if somebody dies from influenza, are we doing post-mortem testing to see whether it was influenza or whether it was COVID-19? There is a surveillance system of death from pneumonia that the CDC has. It's not in every city, every state, every hospital. So we could have people in the United States dying for what appears to be influenza when in fact it could be the coronavirus or COVID-19. Some cases have been actually diagnosed that way in the United States today. A study by Cambridge University researchers mapping the evolutionary path of the virus as it spread from Wuhan, China, found three distinct strains in different parts of the globe. Dr. Peter Forster and his team analyzed 160 genomes from patients and found that the strain in Wuhan mutated from an earlier version. So what I wanted to do in this research, together with my colleagues, is to uh, identify the original viral genome, the original viral genome type, because the virus mutates, it changes, um, and uh, you get variants arising, and, and which is the original one. Instrumental in this is the GISAID database. So this is run by uh, a, a German ministry, and people from across the world, especially uh, from East Asia and China, have contributed their genomic information into this database. The three distinct strains were dubbed A, B, and C. Forster and his team found that the closest type of COVID-19 to the one discovered in bats, type A, was present in Wuhan, but not the city's predominant virus type. My background has mainly been to trace uh, prehistoric human migration through human molecules. So we, we use and have developed software methods to reconstruct prehistoric molecules which no longer exist. And if you apply that, you find out that uh, uh, a location in the network, which we've called type A, is the original type that would have infected humans. Then it would mutated and change into a type B. This type B was then the first genome to be picked up in Wuhan when the disease became apparent. Um, and so researchers might be forgiven for thinking at the time that B is the original type. Um, but actually it's, it's not. It's type A, which in Wuhan is only a minority type, but B has become the majority type during the outbreak. Um, and that has mutated further into C. Now the C type is not found in the early phase of the outbreak in, 
in China. And it is found outside. For example, it's well represented in Singapore. Because all these mutations have happened without anybody realizing a disease is among us. This is in, uh, well, the first genome that we have is from Christmas Eve in 2019, which is uh, 24th of December, obviously. Uh, and what came before that, we don't know. What is now important to consider is that the earliest genome which has been placed into the database is not necessarily the origin of the disease. Um, if I had sampled, you know, someone from Scotland and put him in the database first, then obviously it would look as if Scotland was the origin. That That is not um, a valid approach. And I'm, I'm saying this because there are people who do take this approach, but that's not the way to do it. Ça a commencé par de la toux sèche, franchement, pendant presque une semaine de la toux sèche, tous les jours presque. Après, c'est la fièvre. Je commence à voir de la fièvre et là, et là les pour eux, c'est une infection sévère, très sévère, c'est ce qu'on m'a expliqué, mais ils n'arrivent pas à, à détecter la... But the first suspected case of a COVID-19 infection in France could date even further back in time. Dr. Michael Schmidt, head of the medical imaging department at the Albert Schweitzer Hospital in East France's Colmar, reviewed 2,456 chest scans performed between November 1, 2019 and April 30, 2020. According to the retrospective study, the first COVID-19 infections were identified on November the 16th last year at the hospital. French athlete named Elodie Clovel. Sorry, French people. She had gone to the Wuhan military games in October of 2019. And in March, she reported that back then, many people in her delegation, including herself, were sick. And recently we discovered that there was a case in France, December 27th. And that case was a man who got infected by his wife and then they infected their child. So that's relatively strong evidence of human to human transmission. France has now confirmed that on the 27th of December, they had 
human-to-human -human transmission happening in their borders, that made the world kind of reevaluate this situation with these athletes getting sick. So it turns out that not only has there not been an investigation this entire time, the French government said it will not test any athletes who went to the Wuhan military games. And not only are they not testing the athletes, they also told the athletes not to speak to any media. So they've been gagged and they're not going to be tested. Built many years ago and became a uh, by, by the Army Chemical Corps. Uh, it was one of their more important locations and the uh, really the heart of of a chemical warfare development, or I should say, biological warfare testing and research is in uh, in in Fort Detrick. That's the uh, here in Frederick, Maryland. The CDC has now shut down Fort Detrick. Let's find out what Fort Detrick is and what it's all about. Fort Detrick is research into deadly viruses and biological weapons at the U.S. Army lab was shut down over fears they could escape. Fort Detrick research is banned from working with anthrax, Ebola, and smallpox until the procedures have improved. We'll scroll down here and I wanted to show you some of these areas. The Army's Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases, based at Fort Detrick, says its primary mission today is to protect the war fighter from biological threats, but its scientist center at Fort Detrick is unclear. They're talking about being shut down for weeks, possibly months. A decision for the CDC and prevention to shut down a Fort Detrick military lab may affect research underway there. At the time of a cease and desist letter from the CDC, the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases was working on a multi-year project to develop antibody-based therapies for four lethal viruses. What went wrong? The CDC and its inspection findings noted six departures from the federal regulations for handling select agents and toxins. Another departure was that the military laboratory systematically failed to implement biosafety and containment procedures. In one case, personnel deliberately propped open the door to the autoclave room while the employee removed biohazard waste. This deviation increases the risk of contaminated air from room escaping and being drawn into the autoclave room where individuals do not wear respiratory protection. And what is this research paper? It is the broad spectrum coronavirus antiviral drug discovery. Hmm. And it came out of Fort Detrick. Okay, so let me repeat. Two doctors at Fort Detrick published in 20, uh, it was uh, written and released in August of 2018, and it was published in February of 2019, a paper on broad-spectrum coronavirus antiviral drug discovery. One of the names on the report was someone who I've never studied before. It was actually the Fort Detrick Science Director. Ooh, what's, this, what's this handsome fellow's name? Siri Bavari, S-I-R-I, B-A-V-A-R-I. He's no rookie. He's been there a long time. Hard to tell. 10, 15, 18 years he's been at Fort Detrick. He's a director, so he's a big shot there. He's overseeing a lot of people. Uh, and uh, But in 2016, we see this in really interesting report that came out saying that he's seen as a uh, almost like a, a dictator. A lot of people complaining about him being very hard to work for. That he has favorites, uh, and uh, but what really jumped out at me here, amongst all the complaints, 
was this paragraph here. The army investigator determined that Bavari uses his power and authority to limit researchers from submitting grants, proposals, and getting funding from the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, or DTRA, a Department of Defense agency that is a major USA MRIID founder. So Dr. Uh, Bavari, he was at the uh, Fort Detrick for a long time, but uh, uh, something happened. Uh, sometime around September of, of 2019, he said, you know what, I want to do something else for a living. So he was there for at least nine years, and I think based upon another article, 14 years. And then all of a sudden he says, you know what, uh, I've had a good run. I want to do something else. And he starts his own consulting company. Research, of course, going into the, uh, the vaccine for, for COVID-19, which we know is really SARS, SARS COVID-2. And who, who, who are they referencing? Who was a subject matter expert on this? Ooh, Sina Bavari at Edge Bioinnovation Consulting and Management. Isn't that interesting? Oh, yeah, yeah. Bavari previously, previously spent many years as chief scientific officer at the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases. Down by CDC in 2019, it says it had several serious protocol violations that year. And this is what he was talking about. This is what I've talked about numerous times. Okay, this is very important. When this happened, everything started. Now, of course, that could be a coincidence. That could just be a total random lucky coincidence, right? It just so happened that a lab working on coronavirus and bats just so happened to have a leak right before the time period when we had random illnesses that were tied to the exact same symptoms of the coronavirus we're dealing with now that ended up having the exact same symptoms in other places around the world that, you know, ultimately led to being coronavirus, but it's not the same one from the Fort Detrick that had the same exact things in the same exact time. It's, it's, it's kind of ridiculous to have this have never been researched. Right. The CDC, the World Health Organization, the Trump, any, nobody is even caring to look at Fort Detrick. How is that possible? It's possible when you start to ask, what would they do if this was the case? What would they do if they found out that they either accidentally released this or let, what would they do if they found out they accidentally released it? Right. They would obviously cover it up. Histor historically speaking, that is what this government does. Now, obviously, if this was an attack, well, then that's an obvious answer. They wouldn't want you to know it was happening because they attacked somebody. That's important to think about. Now, we're talking about the idea of these bioweapons, right? The idea of, of manufacturing these weapons and working on these weapons, which is the only thing they do in these labs, right? They do make vaccines, but they make those vaccines to protect themselves from the weapons they're making, right? Anyone honest will tell you this. season is ramping up early. The CDC says 60% of the country has some level of flu activity, and that's unusually high for this time of year. The Army's top germ lab was abruptly shut down. Tonight, the CDC trying to extinguish the health emergency linked to e-cigarettes until it figures out why so many people are getting serious lung injury. This year, even before peak season, 30 states are reporting a higher number of flu cases than at the same point last year or even for the last 10 years. In June, the CDC goes to this medical facility and they find that this facility has not been following protocols about containment. And it's exactly at this point that vaping illness, which had been its symptoms, are literally almost exactly the same as COVID-19. Even the lung CT scans, which are very strange, are strange in the exact same way as they are strange in COVID-19. They have a sort of a ground glass appearance inside of the lungs. It also causes pneumonia, fever. And so that's why this has come into this timeline. Since 2014, elderly people did not need to tell their doctors if they had pneumonia to get a certain kind of vaccination. But on this day, the CDC changes that and says now, if you want that vaccination, you have to first tell your doctor that you have symptoms and then they will give it to you. 
And we do know that the CDC monitors healthcare visits from patients. They have a very advanced system that tracks keywords, symptoms, all kinds of stuff. And here on July 1st, the Department of Defense just cancels that request for bidding. And they give no explanation as to why that happened. So this is the Department of Defense CBD. It's in Virginia. And here is Fort Detrick. It's in Maryland. So right around the time that they canceled this phase one project, a mystery respiratory disease is reported in Northern Virginia. There are over 60 elderly people infected and there are deaths and some of them have contracted pneumonia. Wisconsin reports a vaping illness cluster. How do people form a cluster if it's non-communicable? Don't know. Two deaths from the mystery respiratory illness reported. Here we see another advertisement for an animal caretaker at Fort Diedrich. And here on the 15th of July, 2019, the CDC sends a cease and desist letter to the lab telling them essentially to shut down most operations. Then we see another death related to this mystery respiratory disease that's causing pneumonia. And then we find another mystery respiratory illness that's causing pneumonia. That one is right here, right outside of Washington, D.C., which is the headquarters for all of these operations. On the 18th of July, the military lab is shut down. Now, what is this military lab actually doing? Even though in the past they've gotten in trouble for handling viruses that weren't in their database, you can actually find a list of those ones which are in their database. So these are the agents and toxins at Fort Detrick. Swine flu, Ebola, and SARS-associated coronavirus. So it seems that they have animals there, they have a coronavirus there, and that they were shut down for failing to comply with proper containment protocols. So because we can see reports in July of over 60 people being infected, that may have happened in June. Illinois reports a cluster of vaping illness. The US CDC looks into those two nursing homes that aren't related to each other, that both are in the proximity of this laboratory, that both fell victim to an unexplained respiratory illness that causes pneumonia. And they declare that the cause is the common cold. By this point, the case rate has more than doubled in one month. On the 5th of August, this is when it was widely reported that the lab had been shut down. And the CDC says it can't release details because of, quote, national security concerns. On the 19th of August, 2019, the CDC pushes for expansion of its already existing surveillance system for patients' symptoms. The NSSP is something that essentially spies on you when you're going to the hospital and telling your symptoms and that kind of stuff. Here on the 21st of August, it's announced that something called the Event 201 will take place. This is essentially a forum about what might happen in a global pandemic, focusing more on, by the way, the economic impact rather than on the loss of life. Here we see the first death attributed to vaping illness. This is the earliest theorized date of the COVID-19 outbreak. Starting around October of each year, the CDC starts to track the flu season. And that begins here on the 28th of September. The next day is the peak vaping illness cases. From the day after they start tracking flus till now, the cases have inexplicably gone down. No one knows why the cases of vaping illness started to go down as soon as they started reporting on flu illness. These are Maryland, which is where the biochemical research laboratory is. So overall, the flu activity was a level two and the intensity was a level one. This also includes flu-like illnesses. ILI means influenza-like illnesses. But the percent of people going to hospitals for influenza was higher than it had been in at least four years. And the influenza-like illness emergency visits percent was the second highest in four years. They do these reports weekly and the next week it was the same. The week after that, the flu activity was level five and Maryland is the first state in the United States. Then the Wuhan military games event begins. And at the same time, event 201 in NYC happens. The next week activity goes down a bit in America, but there's the first flu death and the first pneumonia outbreak is recorded. And this is just in Maryland I'm talking about. With this evidence, you could say it's possible that the US military was doing experiments on animals using coronaviruses. And because they failed to follow protocols for containment, there was an outbreak nearby. The CDC found out about this, investigated what was happening, told the public it was a common cold, 
and then shut down the lab. Then they started reporting the outbreak as cases of vaping illness, which had nearly identical symptoms. Then they waited until flu season started and started transferring those over to regular flu and just chalking it up as, oh, this is a bad flu season. And then either intentionally or accidentally, somebody who went to Wuhan was infected and spread that virus to Wuhan. So, but a crazy thing about this vaping illness is it's so similar to COVID-19. It even has the situation where you will treat somebody with antibiotics and they'll seem to be getting better and then come back and their pneumonia is even worse, which is almost exactly the definition for pneumonia of an unknown cause. So the only reason that we call this vaping illness is because the thing that everybody has in common is that they're vaping. But the interesting thing is, vaping also increases your likeliness of getting COVID-19. And this is according to doctors, not according to me. So it could be the case that these people were contracting COVID-19 because they were vaping. Maybe a weaker form of the virus that needed you to be vaping or have weakened lungs to invade your body.